Good morning, church family. Please stand and join us as we sing.
Well, good morning. You guys may be seated. It's good to be with you all this morning. It's good to hear voices singing and all directing our hearts back to the gospel. It's one of the best things. It renews our soul, renews our minds. So we want to touch base on a couple announcements we have going on. Um, if you were not aware, we are at Bertram today, uh, right after church. Uh, it's Bring Your Own Picnic. If you, uh, if you weren't planning on that, go ahead and grab something on your way or just go and hang out for a while. And um, They've got all kinds of activities and good time of fellowship. Um, a couple other things we have coming up. I guess more important than that is we on Wednesday night are going to have um, the pastoral search committee is going to be meeting. So if you guys would be praying about that, uh, we've put together a profile. If you want to go on the website under the announcements tab, um, there'll be a link there that you can see kind of what we've been working on. But if you guys would be praying for us as we're going to continue to meet and continue to discuss and um, kind of dissect what we're going to be looking for in a pastor and um, it's weighty stuff. It's super exciting. I mean, considering the last year of where we've been and, and um, all the guys from BEFC and Strengthening the Church coming, uh, not BEFC, I'm sorry, um, Bethlehem College and Seminary and uh, Strengthening the Church coming to share, but also honing in on our own church community and looking for that pastor. Um, <clears throat> Haitian Hustle's coming up. We have that. That's a, always a highlight. Don is uh, the contact. She's over there. She's also, congratulations to the whole Bankson family. They had a beautiful wedding last night for Hannah. So congratulations to all of you. And then we have baptism at the end of the month. So keep that in mind as well. Um, that'll be coming up. And also another uh, highlight of the summer is when you see people profess their faith, um, taking a stand for Christ, digging their feet in and saying, this is what I'll be grounded in just a public profession of that. So if you're looking for any more of those announcements or you're looking to get plugged in, um, you can either go online to the announcements tab. You'll see everything that we talked about today. There's also a welcome table in the back. Um, there should be copies of that pastoral profile as well on the welcome table. So you can check in over there or there'll be also folks there to meet you. If you're new and visiting with us today, we'd love to shake your hand and welcome you. So with that, let's pray for our offering. Lord, we come before you this morning, broken sinners, excited to dive into your word and be united in worship, be just overcome by who you are and how great you are, and yet you would be mindful of us. So I pray that you would be alive and well with us in this room, and that we would sense your presence, and that we would take this uh, time in the word, and it would give us direction, and that it would ground us for the rest of the week, and that our time in the word would be meaningful and purposeful and honoring to you. So we praise you and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
this moment when the lights went out and death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history
Lord, you are our Savior. We, we know you love us. We feel your love. We just ask that you give us the power and the, and the uh, ability to love others as you have, Lord, and just open that to us. And just thank you for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. Just uh, It is tremendous, and just keep us, keep our minds on you, Lord, that we can celebrate your love. Just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids are dismissed for Children's Church, and uh, turn around, greet your neighbor, say hi. Good morning. Can everybody hear me just fine? Yeah, my name is Benaya Ariel. Um, thank you for having me. I am a student at Bethlehem College and Seminary. I came here with my wife and my, my wife Sarah and my daughter Felicity. So thank you for having us. Um, if you have any question or complain, um, don't ask me. Ask Blake <laughs> or Chris. Um, so, we'll be continuing our series in the book of Colossians. Today, I will be preaching from Colossians 3, verse 12 to 17. So, open your Bible to Colossians 3, verse 12 to 17. Colossians 3, verse 12 to 17. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful that the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in words or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. God, thank you for gathering us here today. Thank you for giving us a time and place to meet. We ask today that should what I prepare stay true to your word, let it be quickly remembered. But should it stray from your word, let it be quickly forgotten. Give us today soft hearts that respond to your words and let us not just be hearers of the words, but doers also. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're too heavenly minded, you're off no earthly good. Sometimes, this is what I heard from well-meaning Christians when they say they want, when they want to warn other people to not think too much of spiritual things, that they forgot their duty here on earth. Now, although this advice has some value, it fails to communicate to us that in order to be of earthly good, we do need to, have to be heavenly minded. I believe that if you were a good listener, this was the passage that was preached two weeks ago by my friend Joshua. What he preached two weeks ago was a very important linchpin in the book of Colossians, in which Paul, the author of the letter, moved from doctrines or teachings to commands. Additionally, my friend Matthew preached last week, showing to you that the commands that follow in the entire book of Colossians are grounded in the truth found in Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4. 
Therefore, as we continue our series in the book of Colossians, we must remember that all the commands that we will encounter must be obeyed because of the reality of what Christ did on our behalf described in Colossians 3 verse 1 to 4. Now, in order to remind us what that passage is, I will read it to you. This is the reason why we must obey the commands in our passage today, that is verse 12 to 17. So I'm reading from Colossians 3 verse 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ with your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So to recap the passage that I have just read, what did God do for us in Christ? In short, what God has done for us in Christ is uniting us in Christ so that we share both in his death and in his life. In verses 1 to 4, Paul described this reality, our union with Christ, by saying four things. So number one, what God has done for us in Christ is that we have been raised with Christ. We share in Christ's resurrection. This is to say that while we were dead in our sins, God was gracious to make our souls alive in Christ. He gave us life while we were dead in our sins so that we may believe in Jesus and thus be saved. Number two, what God has done for us in Christ is we have died. What have we died to? According to Paul, just a few verses before in Colossians 2 verse 8 and 20, we who have been raised up with Christ, that is, we who have believed, have died to the elemental spirits of the world. Through the context in chapter 2, we know that the elemental spirits refer to demonic teachings that tempts us to be justified or saved by our own works, our own self-righteousness, by following human traditions and not by faith in Christ. We must remember that we are justified, that is, being declared as righteous, innocent, and guiltless before God only by being found in Christ. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul reminded us to not follow this kind of self-justifying, self-saving, demonic teaching, saying, quote, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are seared, who forbid marriage and requires abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving, by those who believe and know the truth, unquote. As we can see here, we are to completely reject this type of legalistic, demonic teaching that would damn our soul if believed. On the contrary, God said that we have died to these kinds of teachings. Therefore, those who hold to any kind of self-justifying teachings, just as taught in the religion of modern Judaism, Catholicism, or Islam, are damned by God for they would try to attain a righteous standing before God by their own merit. Just as the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 1 verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be damned. And what does it mean to be damned? It is to be cast into hell forever, to endure forever the whole of wrath of God, so that even if the condemned had endured God's wrath for a million years, he has no less days to drink, to drink God's wrath than when he first was condemned. On the contrary, our only hope of salvation is to realize in and of ourselves we are bereft of any righteousness that would allow us to stand before a holy and terrible God. And thus, in our terror of this God, we cast ourselves to Christ, holy and unreservedly. Just as the hymns puts it, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. Or as another rite puts it, My faith has found a resting place. From guilt my soul is freed. I trust the ever-living one. His wound shall plead for me. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Number three, 
what God has done for us in Christ is that our life is now hidden with Christ. This is to say that Christ is our representative before God the Father. No longer do we have to face the Father in our own sin and self-righteousness, but we now face the Father having been found in Christ, if indeed we have trusted in Him. To be sure, none of us are good enough to face the Father alone, because we are sinful, and whatever good we can offer to Him is done with sin-stained hands. None of us in, in and of ourselves are good enough for God, since God requires us to be sinless and righteous, perfect. Because of this, we need another person to face the Father on our behalf. We need someone who can be our representative and advocate. We need someone who can be sinless and righteous on our behalf. We need someone who is good enough for our righteous standing before the Father. And this person is Christ. Only Christ is good enough to stand before the Father. And our only hope is to be found in Him. So that not only were our sins were transferred to Jesus' account when He died on the cross, being crushed by God's wrath on our behalf, but also being clothed in the Lord Jesus, his righteousness is now counted as ours. Therefore, it can be said that our life is hidden with Christ, since we are found in him and he lives to make intercession for us before the Father. The good news of the gospel is this, not that we are good enough, not even that God makes us good enough, but that the good news is this, that Christ is good enough, he is righteous enough, he is blameless enough, and that we are in him we who have trusted in him alone for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life. And this is the gospel. The gospel is that Christ is good enough and we are found in him if indeed we have trusted in him. So salvation is of the Lord. We contribute nothing to our salvation except for the sins that makes it necessary. Just as one writer puts it, not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. Number four, what God has done for us in Christ is that when Christ appears, we will appear with him in glory. The reality that we belong to Christ, that we have been brought into union with him, that we are children of the Father, and that we are being indwelt by the Holy Spirit is not obvious right now, both to us and to others. The glorious reality that we belong to God is hidden both from our eyes and from others. Or as the Apostle John puts it, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. The glorious truth of who we are, that is, children of God, is not yet manifest, but it will be made manifest when Christ, our eldest brother himself, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Then, and only then, we shall be all changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the, tr at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So, how then do these four realities of our salvation lead us to obey the commands that the Lord gave us this morning? The answer is twofold. First, as people who are saved and are waiting for the full redemption of our body, we ought to act according to our new nature as children of God. We are to act as citizens of heaven, not as citizens of earth, for we really are citizens of heaven. Yet we must not obey in order to be saved, for all who rely on self-saving and self-justifying obedience to God's command are under damnation but we obey as one who has been decisively saved by Christ, as someone who is free from the curse of the law. So, if our future bodily resurrection and our eternal life with God should be our certain blessed state in the future, and if our portion with the Lord is so secured in the hands of Christ, who is the guarantor of our salvation, should we not then ponder the things 
above by imitating our Lord in His love. And this is why the Apostle Paul said in our passage today, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. If indeed God the Father had transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His Son, should we not then act as citizens of that kingdom? If we are indeed waiting for the redemption of our body when Jesus returns, should we not then imitate him in our souls while we wait for the redemption of our bodies? If, we have, if what we are should be made apparent, should we not then act according to what we really are as children of God? Surely our future blessed state of being with Christ and being with God in the new heavens and the new earth should cause us to start to act as citizens of that better country while we still live among this wicked and adulterous generations. Now, the second connection from our state of being saved by Christ and our subsequent obedience to his commands today is this. If we are brought into union with Christ through the Holy Spirit, and if we really are part of his body, then God will certainly bless us not just with our justification, but also with our sanctification. The Bible talks repeatedly that those whom God saves, He also transformed them to look more and more like His Son. For example, the book of Colossians itself said, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Or again, in Ephesians 2 verse 10, the, the apostle explained that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. He said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then he doesn't stop there, he continued, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The point I'm getting to is this. God doesn't just save us from His wrath and then we can live however we want. If we are saved freely by His grace through faith in Christ, does this mean that we can live like the devil after we are saved? By no means. He saved us in order to glorify Him Himself by us being conformed to the image of His Son. We glorify God, that is, magnifying who He is when we rightly imitate God's virtue when we put on heavenly virtues. So this brings me to my first point, that is, we ought to put on heavenly virtues. And what are these heavenly virtues? Look at verse 12 with me. As God's holy and beloved people, we are to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you, you also must forgive. And above all, these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now I will explain each virtue one at a time. We are to put on compassionate hearts. To have a compassionate heart means that we ought to have a disposition that leads us to have concern over another's misfortune. In other words, we ought to have pity or mercy over our neighbors who suffer. For example, on the issue of abortion, our preborn neighbors are being killed every day, being torn limb from limb, being burned alive in their mother's womb, and being rejected by their fathers and mothers. Do we have compassion for them? Does the way that we vote shows that we have compassion? If not, as God's people who are already made holy and who are already loved, we ought to manifest our true identity as God's people through showing our compassion to our most little and most vulnerable neighbors. Indeed, we cannot claim that we have put on compassionate hearts if we still vote for people who support the destruction and murder of the least of our neighbors, namely the preborn. Just as it is written, judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. And religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their afflictions. Thus, we cannot say that we know God the Father if we ourselves have become terrors to our most precious neighbors, namely the unborn, by electing people who seek their death. On the contrary, our passage today commands us to put on compassionate heart, 
a heart that has a disposition that leads us to have pity and mercy to those who are less fortunate than us. Next, we are also commanded to put on kindness. Here, kindness means that we ought to act graciously to those who don't necessarily deserve to receive gracious treatment. Indeed, this is how God treats us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. If then we have received such gracious treatment from God, should we not also act accordingly? If our neighbor wronged us, we must not return evil for evil. Rather, we ought to treat them graciously. Next, we ought to put on humility. Here, the Lord Jesus himself is our premier example. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Rather, he took on a second nature. He took on humanity so that he is truly God and truly man. Thus, God himself took on humanity, being born in a manger as lowly man in order to save us from our sins. Next, we ought to put on meekness. Here, the word meekness has the same thing as gentleness. To be meek and to be gentle means to bridle one's own strength so as to be soft to be soft to a weaker, vulnerable party. For example, when I hold my baby, I never let her feel my whole strength, not that I'm strong or anything. No, when I hold her, I hold her gently, as I would a creature who is much more smaller and weaker than me. Perhaps we men must pay a closer attention to the command to put on meekness. As husbands, fathers, and men in general, God has given us more strength than he has to the women in our lives. Thus, we must learn to temper that strength with gentleness and meekness. Next, we ought to put on patience and bearing with one another. Here, I believe that the command to put on patience and bearing with one another is part of the same command. Here, the word patient can be defined as the predisposition of being able to bear up under provocation. Here, the, the same word of patience was used by the Apostle Paul in, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1, verse 16, when he said, I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to, re- to believe in him for eternal life. Here the Lord shows his patience by bearing with the apostle's sinfulness and not punishing him despite his numerous iniquities. Thus, the command for us to bear with one another seems to be an explanation of what it means to put on patience. Just as the Lord bears up with our iniquities, so too we must bear with our neighbors. Next, we ought to put on forgiveness. In Christ, we have been forgiven freely if we have believed in him. We are truly forgiven. There is no more wrath for us to bear. Indeed, God sees us as innocent and righteous. If we have received such a great mercy from God, it is unbecoming of us to withhold forgiveness to our neighbors who wronged us. Indeed, the lack of forgiveness in a Christian may be a sign that his profession is false. That is, he has never been forgiven by Christ. The lack of forgiveness is a sign that someone is not truly saved and is not truly a disciple of the Lord. Lastly, and most importantly, the apostle commanded us to put on love. Here we may ask, why does the apostle give love the premier seed above all other virtues? I think the answer is because love is the most superior virtue, for the exercise of it is the most natural fruit which proves that God had loved us. Indeed, all other virtues seem to have their source from love. If we have love, we will certainly forgive others when they wronged us. If we have love, we will certainly have compassion on our neighbors. I believe that this is the idea when the apostle said that love binds everything together in perfect harmony. How then does putting on of love and with it other virtues connect us to our hope in the world to come? I believe that this is because the putting on of love will certainly cast our eyes to the world to come, where our love to each other, to our our fellow Christians, will be made perfect. No longer will our love be tarnished with sin, with covetousness, evil desire, anger, malice. In the new heavens and the new earth, our love for each other will be perfect and we will be perfectly loved by our fellow Christians. Not only that, in the new creation, we will experience God's love more fully. In that world, we will live to commune with God forever. 
Indeed, we will live forever to experience God who loves us. Or as Jonathan Edwards puts it, we, we will experience the, quote, God who is the fountain of love as the sun is the fountain of light. And therefore, the glorious presence of God in heaven fills heaven with love as the sun placed in the midst of the visible heavens in a clear day fills the world with light. The apostle tells us that God is love, and therefore seeing he is, an, he is an infinite being, it follows that he is an infinite fountain of love. Seeing he is an infinite, all-sufficient being, it follows that he is a full, overflowing, and inexhaustible fountain of love. And in that, he is unchangeable and eternal being, he is unchangeable and eternal fountain of love. There even in heaven dwells God from whom every stream of love, yea, every drop that is ever or that, that is or ever was, proceeds. There dwell God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, united as one infinitely dear, incomprehensible, mutual, and eternal love. Unquote. Thus, putting on of love will cast our eyes to that world the world of love where our love for God shall be made consummate. Indeed, this is why the Apostle Paul commands us to desire the gift of love more than tongues and prophecies. For tongues and prophecies will cease. Indeed, every gift will cease except for love. He said, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. In the world of love, we shall see more clearly the love of God with which he has loved us in it, we shall see more clearly that God the Father has loved God the Son infinitely and inexhaustibly, and that we are in the Son. We shall see that the love that the Father has for the Son is now ours. Indeed, we shall spend eternity being caught in the crossfire of love between the Father and the Son. In that world, we will never run out of God's love, for God is an infinite being. Yes, even our capacity to comprehend God's love will never be perfect even in the new heavens and the new earth, even in a glorified body. Now some may have bigger cups by which they can contain their communion with God, and some may have smaller cups. But one thing must be kept in mind. Cups, no matter how big they are, are just that, cups, not being big enough to contain an ocean full, figuratively speaking, of God's love. It will be as if the cup of the Christian will get bigger and bigger throughout all eternity, to, to, to try to contain the love of God which has been poured out into their hearts. And, and yet God, being an infinite and most perfect being, will never run out of love, which is himself, by which he can forevermore supply the cups of their salvation. We would sooner drink the Atlantic Ocean dry than run out of God's love and delight. And to play around with John Newton's words, when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun, we've no less drink we, we've no less love to drink from God than when we first begun. And so, this is why we ought to put on love, for it gives us right now the foretaste of this glorious future that is ours. So thus far, the apostle had commanded us in response to being saved to put on love, to put on heavenly virtues. What else does the apostle command us today? And this brings me to my next point, which is we are to be peaceable people. Look with me in verse 15. Here the apostle commands us, quote, And let the peace of the Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body. So here, the word peace that the apostle used can have two meanings. First, it can mean something like a feeling of tranquility or a state of well-being. For example, this is the same word that Jesus used when he had healed the bleeding woman. He said, Daughter, your faith has made you well go in peace. Or second, it can also mean something like a state of concord or harmony between the two parties. For example, when World War II ended, the newspapers across country had their front page reading something like, peace at last, that is, there is no more hostility between us and the enemies. And so, when Paul wrote, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, which peace is he referring to? Is it ref is it the feeling of tranquility or the state of concord and harmony between two parties? I don't think it's clear from the context, but I do think that it means both. I think the logic goes like this. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, 
has brought peace between us and God, just as Romans 5 verse 1 says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because we have peace with God, this newfound peace will certainly bring actual feelings of peace within us since we realize that God is our friend. Paul wants this feeling of peace to rule in our hearts since we no longer have to worry about our previous enmity with God. This internal feeling of peace should not stay within our hearts. Rather, we are to make it manifest by living peaceably with others. And so the Apostle Paul added, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you are called in one body. Now, since the church is one body, it is unbecoming of us to fight with each other. And so, he says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so to recap, we are to let the peace of Christ reign in our heart, that is, knowing that we have peace with God, letting the feelings of peace fill our heart and living peaceably with our fellow Christians. So thus far, the apostle has commanded us to put on heavenly virtues, let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts, what else does God commands us this morning? If we look to the second half of verse 15, we find that Paul wrote to us, and be thankful. This brings me to my next point, which is Christians ought to be filled with thanksgiving. Now, as people who were formerly enemies of God, who are deserving to be burned in hell forever, should we not be thankful that God has saved us from this untold ruin should we not be thankful that not only Christ died for us, God also sent us His Holy Spirit to cause us to be born again while we were yet enemies of God? None of us dragged our cold, dead bodies to the cross of Christ. No, we all hated God. We ought not take credit in making ourselves alive with Christ. No, the Bible says that while we were dead in our sins, God made us alive with Christ. He is the one who brought us about the new birth. So should we not our hearts be filled with thanksgiving for such a great salvation? Does not the scripture itself tell the story that those who are forgiven much will love much? Just as it says in John chapter 7, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him, that is Jesus, to eat with him. And, went, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at tables. And behold, a woman of the city was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. And she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who was and what sort of woman this is who is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. So Jesus said, A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now all of us have many dreams. Some of us want to be a millionaire. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to that much money. Some of us wants to be famous. Some of us wants to own a nice house. And yet I think if we want to pursue the noblest of goal, we should desire to be like that forgiven woman who was forgiven much and as a result loved the Lord much and be thankful for what 
for all that He did for us. This should be our greatest desire, to love the Lord and to be thankful to Him. And like Mary, to be content to be near our Lord, for this is the noblest desire of all. To be sure, the desire of money, health, a good house, a nice car, a good family, are normal desires. In and of themselves, they are not necessarily evil, though they can be, but none of these good things compared with having the Lord Himself, to be in communion with Him, and to be called friends of God. So, thus far, the Apostle has commanded us to put on heavenly virtues, to let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts, and to be thankful. What else does God command us this morning? This brings me to my next point. God commands us to have the Word of God in our hearts. Let us read in verse 16. Quote, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I think this is a straightforward command. Here the main command is, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then the apostle added two participial clauses, that is, teaching and admonishing one another, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, whenever we see a participial clause, that is, a clause that ends with ing, we must think how this participial clause modifies the main clause. I think in verse 16, the participial clause is denoting the means by which we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. So we are commanded to have the words of Christ in our hearts. But how are we going to do that? We are going to do this by two means. First, we are to do this by teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Or this can be done like this, Sunday church sermon, or through family Bible time or through small groups or Sunday schools. Second, we are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We are to let the word of Christ dwell richly through the music we listen to. Here, the apostle commands us to sing the psalms. I believe that there are great values in singing the psalms, since psalms cover a plethora of Christian genres that we often don't find in contemporary Christian music. For example, the psalms include laments, There are songs in which the singer is bringing to God his sadness, struggle, and doubts. These types of psalms teach us to be honest with God. The psalm also includes imprecatory psalms, such as Psalm 5 and Psalm 109. In these types of psalms, the psalmist is asking God to curse his enemies, that is, God's enemies. Now, this type of psalm may cause some Christian to be uncomfortable, But the fact that it is in the Bible means that God has given these types of psalms for us to sing and pray along. Now, this doesn't mean that we can curse our fellow believing Christians. I think that we can only pray for these curses to befall on God's enemies. So, for example, when Minnesota passed the Pro Act bill, the bill that allows abortion up to birth, I did pray asking God to pour out his curse, his wrath, and damnation on all who supported this bill. I did pray Psalm 109 on them. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. With that said, we also ought to pray for the salvation of those who hate God, for for them to turn from their sins and believe in Jesus, since like them, we were also enemies of God, and and we would go to hell, but God, in his great mercy, caused us to realize our sinfulness and give us the new birth and save us. Next, we are also commanded, God also commanded us to sing hymns and spiritual songs. I think this refers to Christian songs. Throughout our 2,000 years history, Christians have come up with rich, beautiful songs. It is good for us to fill our hearts with hymns and songs which, which accord with the Word of God. Hymns from the early church, such as, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded, or hymns from the times of the Reformation, such as A Mighty Fortress is Our God, 
are good hymns to build us up in the faith. Now thus far, the Apostle has commanded us to put on heavenly virtues, let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts, and to be thankful. What else does God command us this morning? This brings me to my last point, which is that we ought to do everything in the name of Jesus. Read me in verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Here, the apostle brings to the conclusion, to conclusion the section of command. I think what it means to do anything in the name of the Lord Jesus is to do everything as the representative of Christ. Or as Calvin puts it, to do everything in the name of Jesus means that our life must be regulated in such a manner that whatever we say or do may be wholly governed by the authority of Christ and, and may have an eye to his glory as the mark. In other words, we are to do everything with the goal of making the name of Christ known to our neighbors. The reason I think that this interpretation is correct is because when I looked at other verses that describe someone doing anything in the name of Christ or in the name of Jesus or in his name, it seems to carry the idea that the action that they just did was done in order to represent Christ to others. Now, for example, in Mark 16, verse 17, Jesus said, These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name, that is, as my representative. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Or in Matthew 18, verse 5, Jesus said, Whoever receives one such a child in my name, that is, as my representative, receives me. So, there are other examples such as Mark 9, verse 38, or Luke 10, verse 17. So what I'm, going, I'm getting to is this. All these passages seem to communicate that those who cast out demons or to, who receive children in Christ's name is doing, is doing these things as Christ's representatives. So based on this interpretation, I think that Paul meant, what Paul meant was that we ought to do everything in Christ's name is this. Do everything so as to make the name of Jesus known to your neighbor. As a Christian, you bear the name of Jesus since you have been purchased by him. So everything that you do will either make the name of Jesus more attractive or more unattractive to your neighbors. Make sure that you represent him rightly. What does this look like in our day-to-day -day life? Does this mean that every guy in this room needs to, be, needs to get a master's degree in theology and start applying for pastoral positions in churches? Does it mean that every woman needs to start to lead children in Sunday school classes? I don't think so. Although doing these things are certainly noble things in the sight of God, I think that it is a more all-encompassing thing than that. Just as the Apostle says that we are to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. This could look like for fathers working full-time and long hours so as to provide for your family just as God the Father provides us with daily bread every day. And make sure that you do it with joy, knowing that you are working long hours and hard jobs, primarily for the Lord and not just for humans. This could also look like by the way you treat your wife, treating them gently and loving them, as the Lord loves the church and gave himself up for her. For mothers, this could look like staying home with your children, teaching and admonishing your children in the way of the Lord being an example of what godliness in, some, in, in the home looks like, respecting and honoring your husband. For children, obey your parents. Don't vex your parents too much because God has graciously given you godly parents who are trying their best to, prov to provide for you, protect you, and lead you into godliness. For grandparents, this may look like being an example of what godliness looks like, being a model of what mature Christians look like teaching us younglings what it looks like to follow the Lord all of our lives. As you can see, the command to do everything in the name of Christ is all-encompassing in our lives. Just as the apostle says in another verse, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Here, the apostle also added that the manner by which we do everything in the name of Christ is by giving thanks to God the Father through him. Surely, he wants us to see that we rightly represent Christ when our hearts are full of thanksgiving for all that God has done for us in Christ. For God has given us his only Son so that we may not have to face the wrath of God, but
but can live with God forever in the new creation. Because of this, when our hearts are full of thanksgiving, others may see that we truly trust the Lord's promises and that we firmly believe that the promises of God are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus, even eternal life. So let us be a people marked with thanksgiving. Let us be known as happy people who enjoy life even during hard times. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with us, and our boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. Surely we have a delightful inheritance in the Lord. Today God has given us many commands. He has commanded us to put on heavenly virtues, to let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts, and to be thankful, and to do everything in the name of the Lord. To be sure, none of us can do these commands by ourselves. If you read the list of commands in our passage today, and you think, there is no way I can do this in my own strength, you are absolutely right. Welcome to the club. As we realize that the Lord has commanded us all these things, we must remember two things then because we can't do it on our own. First, we must remember that we are not saved by keeping these commandments. No, obedience to these commands will not save us. We already have someone who obeyed everything that God commanded, and that person is Jesus. Only by being found in Him, by believing in Him, we will, will we ever be counted righteous before God. On the contrary, if we obey in order to be saved, then we will be damned. Christ is the only way to salvation. So if you have never trusted in Christ, believe in him this morning. He is saying to you, all who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Come to me, all you who are weary and, and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Surely, if you come to him, he will not cast you out. Indeed, he cannot. Just as one writer puts it, Can the Lord pass heedless by and see a mourning sinner die? Surely he cannot, for he cannot lie. For he himself has said, All who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Surely he will not turn you away if you were to say to him, Nothing have I, Lord, to pay, nor, nor can thy grace procure. Empty send me not away, for thou knowest I am poor. And surely he cannot say no to you if you were to say to him, Gracious Lord, incline thine ear, my request vouchsafe to hear. Hear my never-ceasing cries, cry, give me Christ, or else I die. Thou dost freely save the lost, in thy grace alone I trust. With my earnest plea comply. Give me Christ or else I die. Thou hast promised to forgive all who in thy Son believe. Lord, I know thou cannot lie. Give me Christ or else I die. I die. Come then to Christ just as you are, sinful, wicked, and naked, and he will have you. Tarry no longer to come to him. For if you wait till you're better, you will never come at all and your end would be eternal destruction. And what else should we remember from our passage today, knowing that we cannot keep these commandments on our own strength? We must remember that we can only obey by the grace of God. So don't think that you can do all these commands by your own strength. Instead, pray like this. God, I hear your commands to this morning. I know that you command this for my own good and for your own glory, and I ought to keep it. So help your servant to obey these commands. Help me to glorify your name by keeping your instructions. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us these commands today. Help us then, through your Holy Spirit, to put on love, to put on heavenly virtues, and to be thankful and to live at peace with one another. Help us to follow these commands for your glory and not for our own. Thank you for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, please stand with us. Join as we sing.
Oh, the weight of His glory. Oh, the wonder of His grace, the power of salvation. The poor me from the grave, this hope is not empty.
If you would, just stay standing with me real quick, and I want to ask Benea to come back up real quick. And one thing I just wanted to do before we dismiss, we have these folks come out to us and share with us every week, and we're blessed by that, but I want to send him out with a blessing and appreciation for packing your family up and coming to a church full of strangers and sharing the gospel, all the prep time you have. So if you guys would join with me and praying over him and his family as we send them back to the cities and being thankful for your faithfulness. So, Lord, we thank you that Benet would come out and share with us today. And we pray for a blessing over him and his wife and his daughter. I pray for uh, guidance and clear direction from you as he's in ministry and pursuing that in school and that you would be using him effectively and continue to protect them from Satan and any interference that they would have, Lord. So I pray and and I'm excited to see what you'll do in his life as you continue to shape him and mold him through the course of schooling and then on into your church. So Lord, we we thank you for the life that's been um, given here and brought to us and now in sharing in the word. So we pray that you would continue to bless him in his studies, give him insight, give him biblical wisdom like Proverbs 2 talks about, Lord, that we pray that over him, that you would install that in him, and when he opens the word, that nothing but truth would come out of it because of his love for you and your desire to make your name great through him. So we thank you for them, and we pray a blessing on them. In Christ's name, amen. Last thing I'm going to leave you with. Hold on. I heard it in your voice. Everybody said it. I'm going to read Colossians 3. 15 through 16 as a benediction. So take this with you. May this be true of you this week. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Amen? You're dismissed.